first graders, welcome to your TV classroom. Today is Friday, January 15th. I hope you've had a great week this week. Before we get started with our learning today, let's check in with our zone. So take a good feel of your body and your emotions to decide what zone are you in today? Hmm. You know, Rashid, I have to tell you that I, earlier, when I was teaching second graders, was really kind of in the blue-yellow zone. I was a grump. I wasn't red, but I was grumpy. And you know what? I did some deep breaths, and then I talked with the second graders about how it's okay to have grumpy feelings and to be aware of that during the day. And I couldn't change what was causing me to be grumpy, which was that I was really tired because I didn't sleep well. So I had to make the decision in my brain to be kind to the people around me, even though I was feeling grumpy. And you know what? I'm not grumpy anymore. Just doing that made it so I didn't feel grumpy anymore. Isn't that cool? So now I'm in the green zone and I'm really excited about it. First graders, what zone are you in today? Make sure to tell someone around you what zone you're in. It could be your learning buddy. It could be a pet. It could be a sibling or a friend or um, an adult at home or someone where you're being cared for today. Make sure to tell them how you're feeling because your feelings matter. Now, it is Fact Fun Friday. Let's take a look at our first fact and see how quickly you can find the answer to this problem in your brain. Six minus two. What is six minus two? It's four because four and two make six. What is six minus four? Now, wait a minute. Hold on. We did this six, two, and four, right? Take a look at this number bond. Now, look. Oh. <gasps> What is it? It's two, it's a fact family. Six minus two equals four. So six minus four equals two. Woohoo! I love fact families. Five minus four equals one because the difference between five and four is just one hop. Okay, are you ready for a challenge? I don't know, Rashid, do you think they're ready? Are you sure? Okay. This is something we're going to be looking at next week even more. So you're getting a little preview into the future. Oh, no. Wait, you think we can do it? Pebble, why do you think we can do it? Pebble said, I know three plus five is eight. And I can then use make 10. And 10 and 2 is 12. Did anyone do it a different way? Oh, I heard someone say, well, I know 4 plus 3 is 7. And 5 plus 5 plus 2 equals 12. They took the 7 and they split it into 5 and 2. And 5 and 5 is 10 and two more is 12. Ooh, that was some good math thinking. Way to be strong mathematicians, oh dear. Now, I want you to think of friends of 10. Are there any friends of 10 hiding? There are, look, four and six make 10. And three more is 13. Not so hard, was it, when we stop? and use what we know as strong mathematicians, we can make problems that seem hard, not so hard anymore. Nice job, first graders. Today, we are learning and practicing the strategies for finding a sum greater than 10. We've gone over two strategies so far. We've done doubles plus one and make 10. Today, we're gonna decide which strategy to use for the problem. It says, Make a 10 to find eight plus six. It says use cubes, but I'm gonna use my counter. So Mr. Kevin, for this, for this session, probably all three screens for most of it today. So it says eight 
Eight, gotta make eight. Are you building eight? Make sure you're building eight or drawing eight on your whiteboard along with me. Eight and then six. Okay, six is a five and a one. Five, six. Okay, so they said make, use make 10. So eight plus six is the same as, what am I gonna do? How many do I need to move here to make this 10? Two, do you see how using the tens frame is so helpful? So we're gonna do, 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 do. Now it's not six plus eight, it's 10 plus four. 10 plus four is what? 14, because we know our teen numbers. So eight plus six is, you got it, it's 14. Kiss your brains. Nice job. Okay. Whew. Now we're gonna do a story problem, are you ready? The first time through, we're just gonna say, what's happening? Jonah has eight books. Sandra has six books. How many books do they have in all? What's happening in this problem? Rashid, what's happening? Yeah, there's two students. They both have some books, okay? What are we trying to figure out? Let's read and see if we can listen for the question. Are you ready? What are we trying to solve? You ready, detectives? Here we go. Jonah has eight books. Sandra has six books. How many books do they have in all? What's the question we're trying to solve? How many books do they have in all? That in all piece is important. What does that tell us we need to do if we're trying to find the total amount? Hmm, well, what information do we have to work with? What do we know? Let's read it again. Jonah has eight books. Sandra has six books. How many books do they have in all? What information do we know? We know that Jonah has eight books and Sandra has six books. You go ahead and draw a model that shows this problem. I don't want an equation. I don't want a solution. I just want a model and I'm gonna show you what kind of model I want. I want to see a bar model. So I want to see who's gonna go here and who's gonna go here. Think about who has more books. So who's gonna be in which bar? And you're gonna put their name and the number of books they have. Are you ready? Go for it. Okay, where am I gonna put the eight books? In the shorter bar or the longer bar? Yeah, the longer bar because it's more. Eight books. And who has eight books? Jonah, and I'm just gonna put a J for Jonah. Sandra, S for Sandra, Sandra has six books. Now, if I was to put a question mark to figure out where the question is, what could I do? Hmm, I wanna know how many books in all there are. Okay, so let me show you what we do with these. We make a little bracket like this because it's the total amount and we're just gonna put a question mark. You know what this kind of reminds me of, friends? One of these. Does it kind of remind you of a number bond? <gasps> oh. So how do you think we might solve this? What do you think the equation might be to figure this out? We, what do we know? We know two parts. When we know two parts, what do we do to find the whole? We put them together. Okay, I'm gonna erase my number bond. I'm gonna leave this model here. So we said we're gonna put the parts together, we're gonna to add them, so that's my equation. Six plus eight equals, we don't know. Now, let's build with our cubes. Six. And eight. 
Okay. Do you think we can, it's gonna be more than 10, isn't it? Look at all those, look at all those counters. We know it's gonna be more than 10. So what strategy do we wanna use? What are you thinking? Let's use make 10. Okay, I'm gonna move this over here so it's easier to move. Okay, how many should I move? Two. So now we have 10 and four. 10 and four is 14. So what's six plus eight? It's 14. That's pretty cool. Let's take a look and see what they did on their problem and see how it matches what we did on our problem. They said, find eight plus six. They did make a 10 to find the total. <gasps> Wait a minute. They just used the opposite colors. They did their eight red and their six yellow. Look, they did exactly what we did. So 10 plus four is 14. So eight plus six is 14. There are 14 bucks. Nice job, first graders. Okay, let's do the next one. This time we're gonna do it just here on the PowerPoint. You're gonna do it on your board at home. Okay, so draw what you see here. Seven cat toys are on the floor. Fluffy finds five more. So these red dots, what are they representing? They're the toys on the floor. What are the yellow dots representing? They're the ones that Fluffy finds. It's important to know what our model represents. It helps us understand the math. So the equation they have down here is seven plus five. So we know it's gonna be more than 10. So what should we do? What do you think, Rashid? What should we do? Okay, Rashid says, well, why don't we move up these ones and make a 10? So now we have 10 plus, yeah, 10 plus two. What is 10 plus two? It's 12. So seven plus five is 12. How many cat toys? 12 cat toys. Awesome job. All right, circle the true equation. Ooh, are you ready detectives? Take a look. It says, Nine, let's look at what they did. Nine plus six, and then they split the six into one and five. Hmm, so what is nine plus six? Hmm, do you have an idea? What did they do? They made this a uh, 10, and five more makes 15. So which equation is true? Six plus nine equals 15. Kiss your brains. Oh, okay. Eight children swim. So these blue circles are showing us the children that are swimming. And it says four more join in. So what do we need to do? Hmm. Can you draw the eight on your board? Okay, make sure you have the eight there. Now, four more join in. What should I do? Should I draw more or should I take some off if kids are coming into the pool and joining the eight? Okay, so I'm gonna draw four more. These are the kids who join. Okay, my equation's gonna be eight swimming plus four join. Now what can I do to figure it out? Oh, I can take two from the four and put it with the eight. And now I have 10 plus two. What's 10 plus two? It's 12. How many children are swimming now? 12 children. Kiss your brains. Okay, you're gonna do this one on your own. I'm gonna give you one-ish or two minutes. You're gonna solve and then I'm gonna solve and show you, make sure. You draw the pictures and show your work. Are you ready? Go ahead and do this one all on your own. Kai draws eight red fish and five blue fish. How many fish in all?
Okay, Mr. Kevin, can you show them my whiteboard? Friends, take a look. I had eight red fish and five blue fish. I took two from the five to turn the eight into a 10. And then I had 10 plus three equals 13. So eight plus five, when I make it 10 and three equals 13. So there are 13 fish in all. Check your work. Does your work look like mine? Maybe you use different colors. Maybe you drew circles. But did you get 13 fish? Were you able to show how you made a 10? Great. Okay, here's your assignment for today. You are going to work on page 295 and 296. Now, if you look at the first problem, problem one, it has just the numbers. You are a strong mathematician who knows how to use your tools. I would suggest either drawing a picture or building it with your counters to help you solve it. Just because it's on the workbook page doesn't mean you can't use your counters. Strong mathematicians use manipulatives when they're solving problems to make sure their thinking is accurate. Okay, so page 295 to 296 in your math workbook. Today, we learned strategies for finding a sum greater than 10. We modeled the problem. We identified using the make 10 strategy when we built it and saw that was the best strategy. And we found the solution. And we explained our thinking. Kiss your brain, first graders. Nice job. Now, you need to get ready for your time with Ms. Oslin. Please make sure to grab your learning buddy during your break. You will have a break time while you're participating in your break. Please make sure to take care of your needs, and when your break's over, be ready back here to learn. All right, I hope you have a wonderful weekend, and I will see you on Tuesday. Bye. Let's do a little stretching with our breathing now. Inhale your arms over your head and bring your palms together. Now, as you exhale, arch your back and make goal posts in, from your arms. Then inhale up again and relax. Let's repeat that. Inhale, exhale, inhale, stretch up and exhale. Bach lived from 1685 to 1750. That means in 1700, he was 15. And guess what? The world he lived in then was just as turbulent as ours is today. Some of the things that happened that year were a mega earthquake near Tacoma, which caused a tsunami in Japan. Europeans changed to a new calendar that began its numbers from the birth of Christ. Huge fires destroyed the capital of Scotland and part of the capital of Ethiopia. Wars were fought by Sweden, Germany, Latvia, Denmark, Poland, Russia, Spain, and France. William Penn began holding meetings for the emancipation of enslaved people here in the United States. New York and Massachusetts passed laws forcing all Catholic priests to leave their territory under punishment of death. If Bach could turn to music to comfort him through all the ups and downs of that, you and I can find comfort in it now too. And you know what? Even with all that chaos happening, one special thing stands out about that year too. The piano was invented in 1700. We've all gotten to enjoy piano music ever since. Let's listen to one other dance Bach wrote for the violin. This one is called a Sarabande. It's slower, maybe a little sadder, but it also helps me relax and feel my feelings. If I were to think of words for how this music makes me feel, I would say gentle and touching. What words would you describe it with? Feel free to move to this dance music too and see if you let your body sway and your heart open while you breathe to the music how it feels. Thank you. 
Hey, first graders, welcome back from your break. I see that you have your learning buddy. I have Rashid front and center ready to go. Let's remind ourselves of what your job is when we come together. Your job is to listen, share, read, and write. And you are a strong listener when you keep your eyes on the speaker, when you listen to the speaker, and when you think about the words. You are gonna get an opportunity to do some sharing today. And when you do that, I do want you sharing. I want you sharing your ideas. I want you talking about the book. And if someone is in the room with you and they're also going to be sharing, you get to practice your strong active listening skills, thinking about how your perspective or your ideas are similar or different from the person who's sharing. And then you can continue to have a conversation and learn from their perspective. We have been learning all about fiction. Fiction are stories or books that come from an author and illustrator's imagination. And while some of the feelings and experiences and challenges that the characters have can feel real, we know that fiction is not real. For example, in You Can Do It, Sam by Amy Hest and illustrated by Anita Jerem, we learn that Sam is feeling nervous about delivering uh, goodies to his neighbors. And his mom encourages him. She says, you can do it, Sam. And that's the challenge that he faces. And he's able to overcome it with the support of his mom, someone who's supporting him, who loves him. And that's something that I can really relate to, even though they're bears. And we know that bears don't really wear clothes and bears don't really talk. We also read Big Al by Andrew Clements and illustrated by Yoshi. And we learned about how our character, Big Al, the problem that he's facing is he's the friendliest fish, but the other fish don't know it because he's also the scariest looking fish in the ocean. And so he has to overcome this challenge when he chews through the net and that the other fish get caught in. And then they realize that he's not as big and scary as they thought. And then Big Al has a lot of friends after that. We also read When Sophie Gets Angry, Really, Really Angry by Molly Bang. And we talked about how our character Sophie got really, really angry. And we talked all about how you and I also have gotten really, really angry before. So our characters have challenges and feelings just like you and I. And strong authors and illustrators make their reader, you and I, feel those connections. So today we're going to learn that fiction writers also make us laugh at the people and places and things in our world. And we are going to do that with a book today that is new that I think you're really going to enjoy. So pay attention to the characters, the challenges that they face, the feelings that they feel, and what does the author and illustrator do to make you laugh? The book we're gonna read today is Good Boy Fergus by David Shannon. And this book is really funny. It's about a dog, as you can see on the front cover, and the dog is a white terrier. That's the type of dog that he is, and his name is Fergus. And David, the author, owns this dog in real life. This makes me already think about Mitch and how I could write a book about Mitch. But I don't think Fergus is quite the handful that David makes him out to be in this fiction because surely a dog like Fergus can't be as naughty as he seems in this book. So let's see what you think. Already I'm looking at the front cover and I'm thinking my dog Mitch is not allowed on our furniture but I can't tell you the number of times that I go home after work and I hear him jump off the couch, even though he knows he's not supposed to be there. Good boy, Fergus. Good morning, Fergus. Want to go out? Ready, set. Cat! 
Okay, Fergie, time to go in. Come here, Ferg. Come on, boy. Fergus, come. Here, Fergie, Fergie. Fergus McLachlan, you come here right now. Please, Ferg, come on. Let's go, boy. That's it. Now, I hear the author saying, okay, come on. Come on. Come here. You come here right now. Is Fergus listening? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Fergus is looking at the bottom of the tree. Fergus is not paying attention. Now, I kind of had to chuckle because the number of times that I've taken Mitch out and called for him to come back in, and he's still sniffing the tree. Miss Oslin, same with me. Buster and Bruno. Really? Yeah. Mr. Kevin, your dogs Come don't on, listen. Come on, Buster. Come, Come on, on, Bruno. Do mm. your business and let's go inside. And they're not listening. Yeah. Mm. They're just in the yard. La di da di da di da. Do they also like to chase cats and squirrels? They do. Mm -hmm. And birds. And birds. Ah. Mm -hmm. do, do you think that they would know what to do if they caught one? No, they no. would yeah. not. See, that's what I say too. Like, Mitch, you wouldn't know what to do if you caught it, so don't try. Good boy, Fergus. Yeah, clearly Fergus is not listening. His owner has to go carry him inside. Been there. But the words say, good boy, Fergus. So what do you think the author is trying to tell us here? Take some think time. Turn and tell your learning buddy what you're thinking. Rashid, I'm thinking that David Shannon, our author, is trying to tell us that even though Fergus wasn't really listening, he's still a good boy, still a good doggy, just has a hard time focusing. I can relate to that. Now, let's keep reading, paying attention to how our author is going to make us laugh in this fiction book about Fergus. It's Mr. F, Mr. Itchy Bobo Scratchity Man. Does that feel good? And it says tickle spot. Sit, Fergus. Down. Roll over. Good boy, Fergus. Well, look at Fergus laying down. That's where it says sit, Fergus. But the picture shows Fergus lying down. And then the speaker says down, but Fergus is up on his hind leg, up on his back legs begging. And then he's saying roll over, and that's when Fergus sits. And he still says good boy Fergus and gives him a treat. I think David is trying to show us how cute and lovable Fergus is, even though he has a funny way of not really listening. Let's keep reading to see what other funny things Fergus does. Uh-oh, I'm already looking at the next picture. Fergus! Oh, he's so cute. That's why it's funny, right? Bath time! Do you think Fergus wants to take a bath? Hiding, yeah. Now let's go for a ride. He dries off and then look at his face, is puffed. It's kind of hard to see there because it's white but his fur got all puffy after getting in the bath and then going on a car ride. This is making me think of Mitch again. And Mitch has what we call a love-hate relationship with going in the car. Whenever we want to take him somewhere, he gets really excited. But then when he's in the car, he whines the whole time and paces back and forth and drives us crazy. Don't beg, Fergus. Oh, all right. Good boy, Fergus. Tells him not to beg, but then still gives him some human food. And look at how happy Fergus is. <laughs> kind of makes you think, who's training who? Who's training who? Who's in charge here? I say Fergus is. Fergus. Time for a walk? 
Now this makes me think of when it's time for mid, because you see how the character is like flat on his back and Fergus is on top of him. This makes me think of any time I ask Mitch if he wants to go for a walk, he runs over to the door and he's little, he's like about the size of Rashid and he'll jump up and he can jump really high and he jumps up to the door every time and then I can't get his harness on him and I can't get it. So it's kind of like this. I kind of have to lay down to get him to, to calm down so I can get his harness on him to go. Fergus, no! <laughs> Good boy, Fergie. Dinner time. What's the problem? Better? Better. What did, what did they put on Fergus's food? Whipped cream. You know, we've put like gravy on Mitch's food if we have leftover like from soup or something, he gobbles that right up. Or if we put um, like some, he likes also likes carrots and apples and we'll put his food on top. You know what he does? He pulls his food out and then gets down to the goodies at the bottom and eats those. <laughs> Sweet dreams, little Fergus. Good boy. Aw. Fiction stories can often they often do have some humor and make us laugh at our world and ourselves. And the characters and situations they get themselves in are at times pretty exaggerated, like this one. Like, do you really think a dog can really do that and knock their owner over in real life? Take some think time. What do you think? Probably not. Fergus probably can't do that. But imagine how excited he gets when he sees his leash because he knows he gets to go outside, chase motorcycles, squirrels, cats, birds. So like I said, my dog and Mr. Kevin's dog does the same dogs. Mr. Kevin has more than one. They do the same thing. So David, our author, took Fergus's natural excitement and illustrated an exaggerated picture to make us laugh. We know that fiction writers often make us laugh at the people, places, and things in our world. So as you are reading today, I want you to pay attention to what the author of your book has done that takes a little bit of things that could be real, but makes it really funny and makes you laugh. And what I want you to do when you're reading by yourself is think about what David Shannon, our author, did today and the author of your books. And how can you use humor, things that are funny and in your pictures, as a writer? You can also use the words on your word wall to make sure that you're writing words in a snap and writing them correctly. Now, in order to better know these words in a snap, you're also gonna practice reading your word wall. You'll remember you can read it loud like a monster, scary like a witch, squeaky like a mouse, whisper like a seagull, or invent your own. And I can't wait for you to tell us how you are practicing reading your word wall and how you are adding humor to your writing. Send it to us here at TV Classroom. You can either Ask your adult if it's okay to record you reading your writing or scan it and send it to us or you could drop it in the mail and we would love to read your funny writing here on TV Classroom. You're also gonna continue tracking your reading goals. Today is Friday, so you should have been tracking your goals all week and send this to your teacher so they know what you're working on. And then we already talked about your writing and how you're gonna think about what you're writing, you're gonna think about how you're gonna draw and write it. Think about how you can make your reader laugh and try your best as always. Now is time for our affirmation. Before your affirmation, I want to remind you that on Monday, January 18th, there is no school in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who is an amazing man 
who fought really hard to have equal rights for a lot of people. So we'll take the day off to honor him and the work that he has done. Now, your affirmation today is, I can do hard things. And I know we say this one a lot, but it's one that I often repeat to myself when things get hard, is I say, yes, it's hard, but I can do hard things. Practice saying that with me. I can do hard things. Excellent job, first graders. I hope you have a great weekend, and I look forward to seeing you back here on Tuesday in our TV classroom. Bye. Hey kids, we want to see your work. Just send your pictures and your stories to TV Classroom, 601 South 8th Street, Tacoma, Washington, 98405.